Good morning. All right. Um, we got kind of stuck, really, last week in the chapter foundation of predictive <coughs> analytics. So normally we start with a little recap of what we did yesterday. In this case, given that we have some leftovers, let's maybe jump straight to what I think was the most important slide of last week, which is number eight in our slide book, this one. Arguably this slide is the reason why we accumulated some delay. Okay, why I accumulated some delay, fair point. But I truly believe that it's, it's super important Maybe this is the most important slide in the whole course. If you deeply understand this slide, you're going to master the course. It's as simple as that, really. Or at least the predictive modeling part, which is a major part of the whole course. So in a nutshell, we have this transition here from using data that we captured in the past where we do know some outcome. So just to remind you, we are in the space of predictive analytics and we use methods called supervised machine learning, methods coming from that family, and they process data captured in the past where we do have information about some outcome that matters to a business. And we call this outcome a target variable, we may call that a dependent variable, we may call that a label, or response, or simply target. And we know this target for the past data, we know whether an item bought online was eventually shipped back, we know whether a credit applicant once accepted eventually paid back her loan, we know these pieces of information, the outcome of past cases, the eventual outcome connected to past cases, and we want to leverage this information, building a predictive model that allows us to forecast the outcome for new cases. That allows us to forecast whether an item that is bought online right now will eventually get returned, or will get returned with a high probability, or whether a customer that just walks through the door and applies for a loan would repay this loan, would turn out to be a good payer, good customer, if we gave him the money. And this is what we see on this slide. Past data, learning algorithm, predictive model, forecast for new cases, forecast for the future. And then this was the second reason of the delay we spent quite some time to discuss how these predictions can be useful to managers. How the deliverable of our predictive model, this table you see in the right bit, very thin table, essentially two columns, one of which is an ID and identifies individual observations, and the other is a forecast. It's a model estimate of our outcome, our target variable for the new case where we don't know the outcome and cannot observe the outcome. We discussed how this can support decisions and now it's the time to look into specific recipes, how such models can be built, what's inside this blue diamond, the learning algorithm. Let's peek inside that bit, at least to some extent, and see how this can be accomplished, what, what task this learning or supervised learning actually entails. That's one. Decision tree learning. Decision trees are a versatile approach toward building predictive models. They also form a key ingredient into modern learning algorithms, those that you want to use in your assignment and also when you work in industry. And it's, it's good to start from the basics, I believe. Speaking about basics, before venturing the space of decision trees, let's go even one step further back. Let's go back to the very, very basics, i.e. 
linear regression. Here we have linear regression, and I made some minor updates to the slide just this morning to emphasize the connection because my most favorite slide, the one I was showing you earlier, and to see how we can recover some of these elements inside the well-known linear regression model. Linear regression, as you know, is built upon some assumptions. And without going through these assumptions, we come up with a, a model, or you could say we come up with a hypothesis how the world behaves. A hypothesis, more specifically, how our target variable y connects to the independent variables denoted by x here, and I, for simplicity, assume I have only one x, and we assume this relationship to be linear and additive. That is, well, I call this the, the model assumption or the approach. I did not want it to call it a model because I'm using the term model in a different manner here, um, i.e. The, the green uh, box that you see, prediction model, uh, that is yet something different. So we start from this linear additive relationship. And statisticians call that a parametric model, there just is no other word, so overloading the term model here. They call it a parametric model because we start from a functional form, we have the linear regression function, we believe this function to capture the real world phenomena that we are trying to, to model. Maybe y is sales and x is price. We are trying to build a price response function and we assume the relationship between prices and sales to be linear so that higher prices lead to more sales. Everybody awake? At least you are awake. Thank you for disagreeing with me. Of course, higher prices would typically lead to lower sales. Anyways, we have this assumption of linearity and additivity with respect to y and x, target and independent variables. And the only unknown in this model, really, the single thing we don't know are the beta coefficients, which are then called the parameters of the model or the free parameters of the model, both that we don't really know. And then we move on to a model estimation stage. In a modeling process, we move on to this model estimation stage where we're trying to find good values for these unknowns, for these model parameters. Note that any type of prediction model no matter which technique you want to use, be it a neural network, be it a decision tree, be it some boosting tab algorithm, whatever it be, it has some free parameter that need to be aligned with the data that you have, your past data, your observer observational data, the data with the label, and the independent variables. You fit your model to that data, and this is what the, the learning algorithm does, and this is what is typically referred to as model estimation in statistics. Finding the betas. And you know exactly how you do that. You do it by optimization. You have a objective. Specifically, you have a loss function. And because it's a loss function, you want to minimize this loss function. And this loss function happens to be the least square loss in the most common case where we find the betas by minimizing the sum of squared residuals. And now you wonder, come on, this is maybe first semester bachelor of studies, why is he elaborating that? And um, you are right. Two point. Um, what I try to achieve here is to highlight some aspects of the linear regression model that are generic and that reappear in any other type of model that we will get to know in the reminder. And what really reappears in any model is this optimization element. We fit the model to the data. And we can do this in numerous forms. And soon we see the decision tree approach, which uses a much different paradigm than linear regression. 
but it also fits the model to the data in order to determine the free parameters. So in a couple of minutes, I will ask you what are the free parameters in the decision tree, and if you pay close attention to what comes next, you will be able to tell. Maybe you are already able to tell, but I don't ask you now because we don't want to spoil those who don't yet know. Well, and once we carried out this optimization, this, this model fitting, or this, this model estimation, or what is more commonly used in machine learning, this training. In machine learning, we train a model. Maybe we are, we are just closer to our models that we sort of humanize them and we train them to do well. It's the same thing. We're trying to find the three parameters. Once we've done that, we can use the model. And the last equation, y hat, is our forecast or estimate of the target variable given an observation x, given a value of price, our model will allow us to forecast sales. Once we know the beta, we can generate these forecasts. So this last equation, the y hat equals beta o plus beta 1 times x, that would correspond to the prediction model in my previous slide. That actually is the prediction model. That is the vehicle that has undergone some training that is now parameterized, that has no unknowns anymore, and is readily applicable to produce forecasts if we tell the model x. That's what we need to tell the model. Here's x, here's price, now you give me the sales. And then the model will happily generate these forecasts. And this is where the slide then ends in the lower right pane here, where we produce our predictions. That is linear regression in a nutshell. And now let's see how decision trees perform the same task. We will same, we'll start with the same type of data. The beginning, does that work here? Yeah, so the beginning is exactly the same. We start with this type of data. And the end, oops, is also the same. We'll end up with this kind of forecast. And we have a prediction model to produce them. The difference really is here in the blue part. How do decision trees perform these model estimation or these training tasks. Let's first note down some facts about decision trees. They work for both classification problems and regression problems. Um, classification for nominal outcomes, maybe binary or at least nominal or discrete regression for any type of target that is a number that is continuous like sales. And decision trees work for all both types. So no matter what forecasting problem you face, a decision tree will be applicable. That is not true for any type of prediction method. For decision trees it is. And the way they work is that they, they come up with a set of rules which allow you to subgroup your data. You split your data into subgroups, or you partition your data into parts, and these parts will display some homogeneity. Now that will immediately remind you of electron cluster analysis. Homogeneity, subgroups of data that sounds very much like cluster analysis, it's, it's not quite like that, because decision trees emphasize a different form of homogeneity, what, what they emphasize is homogeneity with respect to the target. While in clustering, we looked at homogeneity across observations, considering all the independent variables that exist, right? I mean, in a clustering application, we do not have a target by definition. So the best we can do is to look for homogeneity across all the independent variables that exist in our data. Decision trees, however, are a vehicle for supervised learning. So by definition, we do have a target, and this is also what our, we are interested in, predicting this target, and therefore it's homogeneity with respect to the target. And then a classification tree differs from a regression tree in that 
we will use different measurements of homogeneity for nominal target variables as opposed to continuous target variables. I put some terms here. Decision trees will minimize the, the overlap or mixture of class labels. That is called impurity. We will learn about some impurity measures. And regression models, or regression trees, I should say, will again look at something like variance or least square, sum of square minimization. So they actually operate similar to linear regression in that sense. And I put some popular algorithms here, uh, C5, C45 or C5 nowadays is a very popular algorithm. So it's CART and you see the two gentlemen on the right hand side, Leo Bryman and co-workers from Stanford came up with a CART algorithm back in, I believe, 1986, at least this is when the seminal book on CART trees was published by Bryman and co-authors and um, a colleague from Australia, Ross Grimland, at about the same time, roughly, came up with the um, C45 algorithm for tree induction, or maybe a predecessor of that. And later on, he coined C5, which is the, the, the modern version of that algorithm. There are other algorithms like chi-square automatic interaction detection, or kite. It's maybe slightly less popular, and you see some characteristics here. But really, they all share the same, or they all follow the same recipe. So differences between these algorithms are, are minor, and the software we use nowadays will really overshadow these differences. You, you will hardly notice what type of actually actual tree algorithm or tree induction algorithm you use. Let's, let's look at some examples. The right hand side shows a tree, a grown tree. So the right hand side is a prediction model. It's something that came out of a learning algorithm, such as the CART algorithm. And on the left hand side, I'm trying to show a visual equivalent to that. We have two classes, red and green. And coming from a credit risk background, I'm just used to label my classes good and bad, referring to good payers and bad payers, those that lend money but don't pay back. And we have two independent variables here, x1, x2, trying to not introduce too much credit scoring flavor. I just came up with x, x1 and x2. These would be in credit risk variables, such as the income and the credit amount. Or if one variable happens to be nominal, it could be something like the purpose for which I plan to lend money. We have these variables. We have our observations, the red squares and green dots, that distribute along these two variables. And we see by the orange lines how the decision tree, the tree model, has partitioned our attribute space into three regions. And in these stylized examples, all regions are perfectly poor, pure with respect to the class label. There are only good payers or bad payers in each region. In each region, I'm sorry. And if we translate that to a rule set, you obtain what you see on the right hand side. So you note the six here, right? Then come on, yeah. We know the six here. And this is, of course, the six. So asking whether x2 is, is less than six is equivalent to cutting through our attributes base, specifically performing or en enacting maybe this split parallel to the x2 axis. And same with x1. And if we organize these splits in a hierarchical manner, the split at x1. Um, this one here, which we, we see here, I do not basically continue it throughout the whole range of x2 values, rather stopped it at a value of 6, 
because my, my, my splits are organized in a hierarchical fashion. I first perform the split on X2, and only for observation data points where X2 actually is less than 6, I consider a subsequent split testing the variable X1. And afterwards, after performing these two tests, I do not consider any further splits. Instead, I label all data points that belong to the terminal buckets, the final buckets that pop out of this tree, of this hierarchy. I label them as either good or bad. I assign them my class labels. We will detail that uh, a bit further, but from the graph, it's intuitive why we do that in this example. Slightly more general, we could make the statement that when we stop growing our tree, when we stop this splitting exercise, finding subgroups in the data, when, once we stop that, all the subgroups that we found receive a label which corresponds to our prediction. That is the equivalent picture for regression trees. This time I, I put some labels on my axis and I'm considering the price response example that's so popular in business administration and marketing. I'm using that example. So be, be careful to not misinterpret that. Previously, x1 and x2 both were independent variables and now sales is the target. Key difference to the previous slide. Consequently, I have only one independent variable, which is the price. And okay, if we just saw how a tree performs tests on the independent variables, and I, I have only one, then I can perform multiple tests on the single independent variable I have got, price, and define subgroups by asking whether the price is above or below a certain threshold such as 3 or such as 8. And depending on the outcome of these tests, I can again sort of label my data. When, when stating sales equal to 2 for all data points where the price is not less than 8. So making this statement here, you might wonder where is this 2 coming from? And it's, it's really not possible to see that. Basically, what I am assuming here is that the value of 2 um, is sort of the average of the target variable calculated among all those observations that belong to this bucket. You have three data points there, each data point, because it's labeled training data that you employ comes with the value of the target, comes with a value for sales, you average over these values, and this average takes the role of the forecast of the tree for all data points in this price range, in this partition of the data. I'm not, not sure how you feel. I always think that the decision tree approach is easier explained in a classification setting compared to a regression setting. So I would like the first picture better than this one. Um, but if you really think about it, it's the same, the same thing. You find split points. The split point partition your data and you continue until you don't continue anymore. And then you obtain a bunch of of partitions, data buckets, and for these data buckets, you look at the target and translate that to a prediction. Speaking about predictions, uh, let's move on. Here is a prediction picker, picture. That was the, the training bit and the construction of the tree-based regression model. And here's the tree-based regression model again, and now I am illustrating how we use that model to generate predictions that's really simple. My new data point is the red one. That's 
a price I consider setting for my, my product. So in my example, the, the price would be something um, like, well, what is that? That's, that's probably something like four and a half, right? Roughly. Excuse my drawing, it's awful, I know. Um, and I wonder, if I were setting my price accordingly, if I, if I charge my customers four and a half euros for my product, what's the quantity I might sell? So I ask my, my, my model, um, what do you think? The model says, okay, well, is the price then less than eight um, and, and four and a half? Clearly that, that, that is less than eight, check. So we go here and then the model asks me, well, so how about three euros? Is your price larger than that? And I say, oh yeah, it's, it's larger than that. Um, so check, we are here. And then this is what the model tells me. It will say, oh, okay, in that case, your price will be seven, uh, sorry, your quantity will be seven units. That's what you're gonna sell. And if I were considering setting my price to five euros or four euros, the model will give me the same answer. You see how the predictions that I get from this model, unlike a linear regression model, will or might not be as granular. In fact, any price between these boundary, any price in this range, will give me the forecut of seven units. Because all these prices end up in the same bucket in my tree model. And for each bucket in my tree model, I have one value, which is the prediction for all the cases, the prediction they receive. Of course, I can grow my tree a little bit, make it deeper, make it more bushy, and then um, there will be more diversity in my forecasts. But in the simple example, all the values in this price range get a forecast of seven units. And when saying all the values in this price range, make sure you understand, okay, so you talk about values for the independent variables, for new observation that you might observe in your business, which you then score with your model. That's the general perspective again. And for classification, it works accordingly. So is this principle understood? How a tree, once we have it, generates the forecast? This example, the order in which I, I test my independent variables, the order in which I test price less than eight and price less than three, is arbitrary and the result would not change if I switch the order. But this is a specific to my example. That's normally not the case. I couldn't help it because here I have only a single independent variable. Otherwise, I can't draw it anymore. That's the downside with regression. So in that regard, the classification tree here is more representative where the order in which I perform splits matters. And in fact, you, it matters a lot. It matters tre tremendously once we start playing with real data. I skipped one slide that introduces some terminology. It's a tree, so we often speak about nodes as the nodes in a graph. We have a root node. The root node would correspond to the starting point where all the data is yet together. And then we split nodes performing splits, performing tests, introducing splitters. Again, terminology goes wild as usual. Importantly, these splits create subnodes, subnodes or internal nodes or the term I like best, child nodes. You have a parental node and when you split it by such a test if price less than three, you create two child nodes and they correspond to subgroups of the data. The child is smaller, right? And then the, the last nodes in the hierarchy, which are not partitioned or branched anymore, are called leave nodes or terminal nodes. Those are the ones that make predictions. 
but you will get used to this terminology. It's, it's just a matter of practicing. All right, um, that was the, the, the easy part. Once we have the model, how to use it. But you all had to learn linear regression at some point, and you know that, oh, well, the, the using of that model, that, that's not the tricky part. That's, that's one line equation in Excel, that's trivial. The tricky part is how, we, we, how do we get the betas? And same story here. The tricky part is how do we identify this tree? And maybe just going back one slide, it would be a perfect point in time to ask you, having talked a little bit about these trees, what are actually the equivalents to the betas, to the beta coefficients in a linear regression model, in this kind of model? Maybe, uh, let me start with the last part. I think this is the most intuitive one. The blue, the leave nodes here, they correspond to the y hat in my regression model. They, they all collectively produce y hat. And in this case, in my simple tree, y hat can take only three possible values because I have only three terminal nodes. So I get three distinct predictions. And then you were saying, and that is, that's the key part here, these, these, these values of, of, of eight or, or three and these, these tests, they sort of resemble the beta. At least in the sense that in a regression model, beta is what you want to know. This is what you need to determined during model estimation, fitting the model to find the betas. What is it that you need to, to find to identify in a tree-based model? We need the split points, but let's be specific. What, what is it really that we need, what we, what we see here? There are three bits that we need. Three. What are the three bits? Who can tell me all three bits that we need? One is easy, two is easy, three is hard. What are the three bits that we need? But feel free to start with one and then take it step by step. We need to identify the variables, price, one done. You have one more for me? The variables you were saying, and then for each variable we need a threshold, two done. We also need the order, that's more supple, that's the hard part, that's easily overlooked. We need to know the variables that we use for splitting using decision tree jargon. We need to know the variables that we use for splitting. We need to know the corresponding thresholds. And lastly, we need to know the order in which we perform these splits. In this example, you see that the split on price with a threshold of three is performed only for a subgroup of the data. Here, you, you remember this, this picture where we made the point that um, <coughs> The second split does not cover the full range of X2. It's performed only for a subgroup of the data, that subgroup where X2 is less than six. So, but I, I consider that covered by saying we also need to know the sequence of the, of the splits. And this is exactly what we need to know. This is the equivalent, roughly, to the beta coefficients in linear regression. These are the, the free parameters, you could argue, but a decision tree is actually not a, a parametric model. So this wording is normally not used. It's a non-parametric model, which would imply that we, we don't really have this notion of, of, of unknown parameters so much. But the, the unknowns here really are these three points, variables to split on, thresholds, and the order. And then the question, how to build a tree, cooks down to giving answers to these points, finding ways to obtain this information. Find, and this is the recipe. This is how you build a, a tree. Find the best possible slit, split, identify the most important variable, and its optimal threshold that is always dependent on the context. The threshold is optimal for 
the split that you perform next. If you split again on the same variable deeper down in the tree, uh, the optimal threshold will have changed. Once you found a good split, you perform the split to obtain two chart nodes, left and right. Price less than three, yes or no, left and right. And for each of these chart nodes, you just repeat. You again search for the best possible split on this child node, perform it, obtain two new child nodes, and continue. It's an iterative algorithm. I meant to show you this slide, sorry. Um, again, some minor adjustments, copying slides together. Uh, this is the pseudocode representation. And that's something, if you're already quite comfortable with R, for the fun of it, I know I have an odd notion of fun, try it out. Um, this is how you can implement your own decision tree algorithm. It's not going to be super efficient, but it, it will do its job. You can try it out, it works. Okay, we can do things between parametric type of models, non-parametric type of models, and semi-parametric type of models. The classic example for the parametric model is the linear regression. We have a functional form that we assume to be true. This function has parameters, and model estimation could be down to finding these parameters. Then there are non-parametric models. And the tree is unfortunately not a good example for that, or not the best example. Stuff like nearest neighbor prototype-based classifiers where you say, I want to have a prediction for a, a customer. I'm doing credit scoring. I want to predict whether a new credit applicant is a good risk. I consider the attributes of this credit applicant. I identify the three most similar cases, customers to whom I lent money in the past, and then I average over their labels, have these three customers, were they good or bad? what's the majority vote among the three nearest customers in an Euclidean sense. And then this is your prediction. And this nearest neighbor based of approach, that was quick, I know, but if you think about it, um, there are no real parameters. That is a perfect example for a non-parametric model where parameters don't even exist. The training data is the model. And you just select subsets of the training data, nearest neighbors, to produce predictions. And then there are the semi-parametric models, which of course are the most of them, and I put the tree, I put it there, um, it's somewhere in between. We do not have the known functional form. The tree can be shallow and then correspond to a simple function. The tree can be deep and correspond to an extremely complicated function. We don't know that a priori. There is no functional form a priori. But once we have the tree, once we, we grew, have grown the tree, it is there, and then we know the split points, and these split points are, in a sense, the parameters of the model. Data-driven. Let the data play a major role in determining how the model looks like. If the data is complex, then the tree might be deep and thus complicated. If the data is not complex, if the relationship between price and sales is simple, then we would probably not need a deep, complicated tree. To model it, we would have a rather shallow tree, maybe as shallow as the one I was showing to you. But let the data determine that. And this spirit, I see that in non-parametric, where I'm anything but an expert, and I clearly see this spirit in machine learning, which is, is data-driven by its gene, really. OK, so um, coming back to the algorithm. We need a way to find variables to split on, and a way to find split points, thresholds, and a secondary matter would be to find or to identify ways when we stop further growing the tree. The splitting rule or the stopping rule are the two ingredients. Different algorithms differ in how they address these two tasks, how to split and when to stop. So probably a good time to look at some examples. We need a way, referring to the linear regression example, we need a way to optimize. Any learning algorithm uses optimization 
at its core. Mathematical optimization is key to machine learning. And when we want to optimize something, we need an objective. <coughs> Let's reason what is our objective. Here's a classification example. We have red points, we have blue points. These are our two labels. Could be good or bad, yes or no, one or zero, what else? whatever, doesn't matter. Two labels. And we have a split. And I want you to judge whether this is a good split. You made two points, that is noteworthy. So for those who see the slide for the first time, uh, your peer made two points. The, the split that we perform here results in chart nodes that are roughly the same size. That's a good observation. And the even more important observation, but in each of these two chart nodes, the frequency of, of blues and reds is roughly the same. Well, our ultimate goal is to tell them apart. And now I don't dare asking what, about you, what you think about this split, because you just need to extend your argumentation. In one of these dimensions, we do a lot better. The left child node is pure. No impurity. It's only blue cases that end up in that branch of the tree. But dimension number two, hmm, only very few cases end up there. And we perform these splits. We grow the tree on the training data. I should say the training sample. It's data that we have and that we believe to be representative. The customers to which we lent money in the past, we believe represent the true population of customers to which we will lend money in the future. That's our belief. It's also our hope in, in machine learning. But it's already given. And there might be a change. Splits like that, which are so specific, might not generalize well to the underlying distribution of cases. Let's imagine a a trivial example, you actually perform such credit scoring and gather data about your customers and then we have the two classes, good payer, bad payer. And from the credit interview that you have with your customers, you trace the, the eye color. You speak to this person, you just note down green eyes, blue eyes, brown eyes. Easily an artifact might pop up in your data where uh, a certain fraction of bad payers has brown eyes. That could then be a split like that, not at a top node, but lower down in the tree, where you end up in a subgroup of the data where the algorithm sees, oh, look, I have these three customers. They're all bad payers. Uh, uh, well, sorry, they're all good payers in my example, blue, good, red, bad. And look, they all have brown eyes. So when I spot a new customer and he or she has brown eyes, I should lend money. These are the good payers. And intuitively, you would know this is nonsense. But in a certain part of a tree, of the tree growing process, a subgroup of the data might exhibit such patterns where nonsense type of variables appear related to our target and then might result in such a split. And then you could ask, uh, why would you want to use nonsense variables in your data? And this is a very fair point. Again, it's just an example. Say these highly specific splits could refer to patterns that are not generalizable, that are not robust, that are just a random artifact in my data, such as the eye color appearing to be indicative of whether somebody is a good payer or not. And I'm assuming the eye color is not indicative of whether somebody will pay back a loan or not. I had a, a similar question in, in earlier sessions of this lecture. And I used to use an example with a, a variable shoe size instead of eye color. And then there was a smart student who basically got me on that example. Why would shoe size not fit 
so well as an example in here. So the variable which appears to be nonsense might actually proxy some other variable. As you say, the so shoe size would proxy gender. And this other variable might actually be connected. And it's a known truth in the banking industry that lending to women is more secure than lending money to men. We might not be able to act on this knowledge if, for example, anti-discrimination law prohibits it. But from a purely statistical perspective, it's a known fact. All right. Okay, so this is the type of split that we would like to see. This is a beautiful split. Not discriminative, too specific, beautiful, just beautiful. That was the preparation, and now we need to measure this. We look at these pictures, we have an intuition, we discussed why this intuition makes sense, and now for an optimization algorithm to digest these configurations, we need a crisp, clear-cut measure. And this is information gain. Information gain is our objective. In classification trees, how much information do we gain from a split? It is connected to information theory, Shannon entropy, um, just dropping some buzzwords here. How much information do we get from a split with regard to telling good payers from bad payers, telling the two classes apart from one another? That's the information we care about. Distinguishing the two classes or the n classes, that's the information we care about. How much information for this goal do we gain from one split? That's the information gain. You see the equation which needs an ingredient, capital I, which denotes impurity. We need a measure of impurity. We need a measure that says this node is not pure, while that node is pure. And in our equation of the information gain, that measure uh, appears in the form of i, the impurity, which is a function of a node, n. And I use capital N for the, the parental node, and n1 and a2 to denote to the two child nodes that result from a split. And then we have pn1 and pn2, which are simply the frequencies, the relative frequencies. So how much of the data ends up in the right child node and how much of the data ends up in the left child node. And these uh, PN1 and PN2, they enter the equation in order to rule out splits like the one shown on the right. So in this scenario, Let's say this is N1. PN1 will be small. And being small in value, it will penalize such a split. Let's see how. We have I of N. We have the impurity of the parental node. And recall, impurity is bad. We want to be pure. Impurity is a no-go. So I of n is something bad, and we subtract something from that. We subtract essentially the sum of the impurities of the two child nodes. If the child nodes are pure, then I of n1 will be low. And if the second child node also is pure, I of n2 will also be small. And if we add these two small values up, they will still be small. And if we then subtract them from the value i of n, the parental node, which I assume to be big, then the result will be still a sizable value. And this means the information gain will be large. 
and then the weighting by the observations Pn1 and Pn2 governs this calculation. So even, even though In1 in the previous example, where we had this branch with uh, just three customers or three observations, even though the impurity of that node was as good as possible, the impurity was actually zero, as we shall see. Although this was zero, um, well, zero is a bad example because then it's, it will rule out. Well, but you see the scaling of this Pn1 and Pn2 in the equation. How this ob objective embodies the two goals we have, telling the classes apart, minimizing impurity and thereby maximizing purity, that's the, the I of N, and having splits that are, that avoid being too specific and applying only to a small fraction of the data, that's the PN1, PN2, the weighting part. And now we need a measure of I, here are some common choices, especially the entropy and the Gini coefficient are the prevailing choices that we use and in practice. Entropy was invented in connection with C45. So uh, that goes back to Ross Quinlan, I believe, while the Gini imp uh, impurity was used original in the card algorithm. So you could associate that with Leo Breiman and colleagues. Also, there is misclassification impurity, but it's, um, it's not used to the same extent, in my experience. And you can convince yourself that plugging in each of these impurity measures, they are alternative measures of impurity, the calculation for the information gain does work out as intended. Splits that separate the two classes nicely will receive a high value of the information gain, splits that don't will receive a low value. I'm illustrating the calculations in the slide book, uh, which you can walk through for yourself. And also you have this diagram here, which reminds us that, or which exemplifies how different situations in a node, by that I mean, how different distributions in a node lead to different values of the entropy and the Gini coefficient. And you see how they peak, all of them peak when the two classes are almost, um, almost have the same probability, or in my example, have exactly the same probability of occurring when the frequency of the red and the blue is the same all these functions peak and their minimum is achieved whenever we only have examples in a node that come from the same class. Then we observe values of zero. And this is exactly the, the notion that we have in mind when reasoning about impurity in tree learning. That's great. That's great too. That's very bad. So these measures give us something that we can optimize, more specifically that we can minimize and try driving down to zero. Zero is where we want to go. So that is something that optimization can work with. The story for regression trees is pretty much the same. We only need to replace the impurity with some other measure, and then we just calculate information gain in the same way as before. So we just replace the I of N part with something else. Entropy Gini coefficients are defined for classification model, and for regression type of models, we typically use the sum of squares. And this is what I'm trying to show here. In the upper part of the graph, I imagine all the data points belonging to one big data bucket. That could be the root node of our tree. And the average 
could be where I put the orange diamond. Roughly, that might be the average, OK? Calculated across all the, the data points, more specifically, the average sales across all the data points, and well, that's more important. But if we use that average, then the variance across our data points will be very large because they are far apart from the average. And if we instead say we split our data into three groups, calculate a group-wise average, calculate the variance in each group, or the sum of squares for that matter. For the purpose of tree learning, it doesn't matter whether you normalize or not. Calculate the group-wise sum of squares, and then add these three numbers up, the overall variance across all the data points will be much less. So the splits that we see in the lower right chart have resulted in a reduction of, of variance of the sum of squares. And this way, we can grow our regression tree. Again, we have something that we can minimize and plug into in our, oh well, again, we have a measure that we can plug into the formula of the information gain. And here is how it could look like. If you want to follow this uh, equation, then please note, it's not really the variance. Instead, I'm, I'm using the pairwise sum of squares here but this is just a different way to do it. It's the same concept. And then this basically takes the role of the entropy of a genie in a regression tree, which again maximizes the information gain. That was the splitting part. We now know how we can calculate impurity for classification and regression. We also know how this measurement allows us to measure the information gain. And um, with this information, being able to calculate the information gain, we can readily implement this algorithm. That was the missing bit where I put quality in italics of a split. Now we could really implement our own decision tree. We have our data set, our beautiful tabular data structure with target and independent variables. For each of the independent variables, we process them one by one, it's like a for loop for each variable. Imagine we arrive at a variable income in a model. And now we look for a possible, not only a possible, but an optimal split on the variable income. We just look through our data, and we could test every single income value in the data that we see. If there are 1,000 customers in the data, maybe we have 1,000 different values of the variable income, and we could test every single one of them and form a split of this form. See how the two resulting chart nodes look like, and calculate the information gain of that split. We repeat that for every possible value of income, in other words, every possible split on income, and then we just check, OK, which one was the best, giving the highest information gain. We store that value. That's the best split on income. We move on to the next variable. Maybe this next variable is credit purpose. We might have something like six different purposes for which people lend money. We iterate over every single one of them and consider splits of that form. Is purpose equal to car? Is credit purpose equal to holiday? Is credit purpose equal to real estate? We hypothetically perform a split. We measure the corresponding information gain, store that information. Once we have tested all possible splits on credit purpose, we find the best one on credit purpose and loop over to the next variable. Once we are done with that exercise, we have a set with 
optimal split for each of the variables that we have in our data. We find the maximum over these, and this maximum is the overall best possible split that we can take in the current situation, in the current position where we are in the tree. We take that split, we fix the two chart nodes that result, and for each of these chart nodes, we repeat the whole process. That's tree growing in a nutshell. And this is how real life algorithms work, just that they do things a lot more efficiently than these two nested for loops that you need. But making algorithms efficient is not our key concern, I believe. At least, I mean, we are at a business faculty. We are concerned with business analytics. We typically do not implement the algorithms ourselves or probably are not that much interested in how we should implement them to maximize efficiency and worrying about how can we parallelize things, etc. That is not our key business. So that is how decision trees work. If you understand that approach, you'll be fine. So last bit to, to conclude the tree part. When should we stop tree growing? We can easily make the tree as complex as we like. In the extreme, most extreme case, every data point ends up in its individual terminal leaf. We have one leaf node for each data point. This means that our tree makes no error whatsoever. Every data point in the training data is classified correctly, but it will be very complicated and it will overfit a lot. You've used that term before. This is a problem here. It will be a horrible tree, but we, we could go that far. That's as far as we could go. Uh, we know it's a very bad idea to do that because the tree will be far too complicated and just memorize the training data without being able to predict future data. The other extreme would be not splitting the tree at all, just taking the root node with all the observations, averaging their target variable. If it's a regression, we just calculate the mean of y, that's our forecast. If it's classification, we just find the majority class in our data, good payer, bad payer. If bad payers are the majority, we always predict bad payer. Or more realistically, in a banking setting, the majority cases would be good payers, so we always predict good payers and accept all the clients, lend them money, and soon file for insolvency. So none of these two extreme cases make sense. The question is where to stop in between. Pruning refers to a, a process in preventing the tree from getting too complicated. And we can perform decision tree pruning in uh, two ways, a priori and ex, ex post. And what pruning really is about is finding a good balance between a tree that is too shallow and too deep and thus complicated. We grow tree from a sample of data that we have observed, which is somewhat representative for the underlying distribution or data generation process that gives us a view on the joint probability of x and y. But we only have the sample. And in the sample, we have structure, true dependency between x and y, but also noise and all sorts of artifacts. And we want to separate these two. We want the tree to be as complicated as it is needed to capture the structure. If the structure is complicated, then the tree has to be somewhat deep. If it's not, then the tree does not need to be deep, can be shallow, can be easily understood. But separating the structure from the noise is, is hard, and, and pruning aims at, at getting there, and specifically it, it aims at avoiding the tree being too complicated. 
One way, one easy way to do that is to introduce some hyperparameters, such as what's the maximum depth of the tree. A hyperparameter is to be distinguished from a parameter such as a beta in a regression model. Making this distinction, a parameter of a model is found during model fitting. When we minimize the sum of squared residuals to identify our beta coefficients in regression, we determine these parameters. Whereas hyperparameters are unrelated to model fitting, they need to be set either by you as analysts, as the, the users of corresponding algorithms, so it's either the user or the user employing some, some process, some empirical trial and error type of process that we will elaborate on in the tutorial. But they need to be set somehow and are not set during model fitting or decision tree growing. But we could determine a priori that we want decision trees with a maximum depth of seven. And then my tree is allowed to have seven layers of splits and no more. That's a possibility. My tree will not get too complicated because I enforce seven layers at most. Or equally, I could basically enforce that a node in the decision tree which has less than 100 observations will not be split anymore. And now you ask where are these 100 observations coming from? I just invented them. It's a hyperparameter. I need to put in some value. That's hard, often. And still, it's done. It's a workable approach. That's pre-pruning because we basically prohibit the tree getting too complicated a priori. Um, and yeah, the alternative post pruning would be we first grow the whole tree or we grow a deep tree. And then ex post we check whether every split that we performed did really contribute. We would assume that we perform a split if we have some information gain. In my example, you can really calculate that for yourself. Uh, the information gain is positive for every split that I take in this example. But if you stop there, let's say, in addition to post pruning, I also set a threshold of four levels at most. So we have the root node level one, then we have the first level uh, two, um, so here's two. And, and here is three, and, and here is four. So I stop here, because I set a maximum depth of four. And then I look at this tree. I could establish that the whole left part is unneeded. In the whole left part, no matter which leave node an observation ends up, the tree will always predict the red class. So all the splits were perfectly legitimate, contributed some information gain, but in retrospect I see, uh, well, actually they were unneeded. So I just prune them back. I chop back my tree, pruning, post pruning to be precise, and just go with the much shallower tree that only performs the first single split with this information gain of 0.317. That's post pruning. And how this is done in practice is um, I might be able to check the statistical significance. Did a split significantly reduce the impurity or raise the information gain? Question mark. If yes, I take it. If not, I don't. That is also a way. Or I assess my tree on an independent set of data, find its predictive power, and then see how this predictive power develops if I prune back some parts. Those parts that contributed the smallest amount of information gain, I, I prune back, I test my tree again, how much has the predictive power decreased, if at all. This was 
is a more empirical way to find a good tree depth or do the pruning, there are standard strategies available to us how we can post prune a tree and pre-pruning always comes in the form of setting these, these hyperparameters. All right, so um, yeah, let's, let's summarize this, this chapter. We now have a good understanding, I believe, of predictive analytics, and we have seen one instantiation of it, decision tree learning, or one and a half if you also count linear regression, which we briefly touched upon. What you need to take home from the whole chapter, not only today, then, is of course the single slide with what predictive modeling is about. I find it very important to be clear on the use cases in business and in terms of the, the how, the machine learning bit, we've seen one algorithm today. You will see more in the coming weeks. Next week, however, will be devoted to the preparation of the, the data and some explanatory analysis. I know that you have basically already done some work of that in the tutorial and this will continue today. So uh, you will have some empirical experience with these parts once we get there. All right, thank you very much. Have a good week ahead and I see you in the week after next week.